Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening to, to everyone who's joined so far. We'll be starting this webinar on Global HR uh, shortly. We're just waiting for a few more people to attend. So hello everyone, and a warm welcome to this series of webinars that focuses on delivering and updating you on the new features and functionality that will be available to you and your organization in Oracle's latest release, 20D. My name is Chris Gomez, and I'm an account director here at Evasys, and my focus is on demonstrating the value that our next generation managed services, as well as some of the other innovative Evasys technologies has on achieving maximum business value on your Oracle Cloud application. As we know, Oracle provide quarterly updates that are designed to continually drive operational excellence and enhance the user experience. Today, I'm your host for this webinar, where I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Vishnupriya Narasimhan, who works in our ERP Center of Excellence, and will be taking us through the HR updates of 20D. Priya has over 10 years of experience across the Oracle HCM modules and is currently leading the entire managed services for HCM. Sabria will be taking us through the hot topics and everything that you need to know about the main features of this release. And whilst we'll try to cover as much as we can, there's, there's lots to talk about, um, but we're not going to be able to, to cover every single feature. So we'll make an extended PowerPoint available at the end of the session that does cover more of, of, of the features that you can actually um, do in your own time. So by means of an agenda, over the next 50 minutes, we'd like to cover three main areas. Firstly, I will take, I'll talk to you a little bit about our, our approach to Oracle updates before handing over to, to, to Priya, who will analyze the latest release and, and provide you with an insight into the new available features, as well as highlighting things to consider when deploying them. This also covers known issues that need to be considered, and, and Priya is going to talk you through these in around 30 to 35 minutes before I then take you through our next generation managed services and how it can help you with these Oracle releases. We will leave some time at the end to cover questions, but please do ask any questions throughout the webinar in the chat option that's, that's available there, um, as we've got a team of colleagues who will respond to each of those questions as we progress through the, uh, the webinar. So when we talk about an update, there are generally four categories of events that we must consider prior to deployment. And firstly, it um, comes the analysis. So we need to analyze and consider each of the options that are available um, to be rolled out and the impact they have on user experience and, and productivity. Secondly, we must analyze and plan how we deploy the updates that, we, that we've decided on as part of the analysis phase and, and carry out some of those um, impact analyses to, to understand you know, the impact on the business before we, we deploy the updates. After planning comes everybody's favorite part in the release, which is the user acceptance testing. And, and that's to ensure that there's no fundamental impacts to the business once the features are deployed. And you know, I'm sure everyone will agree that it's the most intensive stage of this four stage process and needs to be done methodically to ensure that there are no surprises. And then finally, you've got the launch, and that's, that's where you release um, the, uh, the version once you're happy that the tests have not uncovered any showstoppers or, or serious headaches. So once I hand over to, to Priya, her focus will be on supporting the first stage of, in this process. And, and then later, I will talk about how we can potentially help you in the other three areas. But before I, I hand over to Priya, I just wanted to spend a, a couple of minutes talking you through the structure of the new feature slides that, that we'll have and that Priya will be using. And some of you may have already um, seen these or been familiar with this, um, but please use this as a reminder whilst I take those that are new to these webinars through the, the areas. Well, firstly, at the very top, the, the highlighted area, um, we can see that we include the, the new release of effectively the short name of what it actually is. Below that is then the, a short description of the release to better inform you and give you a brief of, of what that feature is for. 
Underneath that, we then include a, a business benefit section, so you can see the impact it may have on your organization with the outcomes it could give you. And, and we then include a high level impact analysis on the right with um, four main areas. So firstly, the impact level provides you with a gauge of how it could affect your organization and the subsequent amount of effort required for UAT. A low would mean no large scale impact, so regression testing isn't really required or, or, or there may be a light amount of regression testing. Um, and obviously a high would, would have that complete opposite. We then inform you whether the update will just appear or whether you need to look to enable or, um, that feature to benefit from it. Does the update require any configuration? We highlight this too as part uh, of the feature summary. Um, clearly an update that needs configuration needs more planning time to gauge the level of configuration that's actually required. And then we've also added a, a quick win gauge which takes into account the level of effort and time required to get this feature set up. Okay, so before I hand over to, to Priya, I just wanted to run a very quick poll to understand how the, the attendees on, on this webinar today and um, perceive the Oracle mandatory updates. So I'm just going to launch the poll now. So you should see on your on your screens now just a question of, um, of how you perceive Oracle's up, um, updates um, every quarter. Do you see them as a an overhead or actually do you see them as, as a value add because of, of all the features that, um, that they get updated and included? So if, if I could ask each of you to, to start voting now. I'm just going to wait for a few more seconds as the, uh, as the votes are coming in still. Okay, so I'm going to close off the vote now and, and share the results with you. Um, so the results are in and I can see that many of you have actually voted for um, the fact that it's, it's a value add, which is, which is really good to see. Um, but for those of you that feel it's an unnecessary overhead, stay tuned um, at the end as some of the services that we have to offer may be beneficial to you in actually um, making it less of an overhead to, to actually carry out those, those quarterly updates. So, Priya, I'm sure everyone is eagerly waiting to hear from you about this release. Can you um, tell us a little bit about what, what we're going to expect in 20D from, from an HR perspective? Yes, thank you so much, Chris, uh, for giving a very brief introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the members on the call. So today we're going to look into the feature releases that's part of Global HR. Uh, this is broken into multiple activities based on what we have. So the first item that we would see is the common features. So these features are common across all modules of HCM. So we would just have a very quick, brief introduction on that, so that when we talk about those features in that respective sessions, it's more easier to understand. And with respect to global HR, we have around 49 features that's been introduced as part of 20D. But uh, from our impact analysis, we see that um, it's around uh, 26 F, uh, items that are default, which would be equipment, and six of them which are opt-ins and equipment. So this doesn't mean that the other features aren't beneficial, but then the focus here is to highlight on items that would need less configuration, less amount of time in terms of testing or, or implementing that, because you just have a two-week time frame in order to complete your enabling, enabling the uh, items and to test them. So Please do visit the other rest of the features. On this webinar, we're going to look only at the features which are quick wins. So quickly moving on to the HCM common features. The first one is a very important feature in terms of a system administrator access. So where we have a new process that can enable us to generate data security roles and profiles automatically. So this particular process was actually introduced uh, a couple of quarters ago, but the benefit that we achieved out of this particular 
feature in this 20D is that Oracle automatically submits these role generation process so that when the instance is back to you after upgrade, this process should ideally have been completed. So what's the purpose of this particular process? Because Oracle keeps introducing a lot of new features and features that are linked with data security profiles, features that are linked with roles. These have impact if the roles are not regenerated. So it becomes a mandate process to run this regeneration after every upgrade. So now Oracle would submit it automatically, but then we have to ensure by just looking at the status of the process, if it's complete or not. So this process might take a bit longer for larger organizations, but otherwise uh, Oracle suggests that it should be completed by the time you get the instance up after an upgrade. The next one are certain uh, enhancements on the data loader. So if you, if you see, I've put uh, three uh, items on the same slide because we're going to talk about detail of these, each one in the respective module session. So there are data loader enhancements in terms of new objects for absence management, benefits, global payroll. So what does that mean actually to you is that now you can do bulk loading for these objects. So earlier they were limited objects. Now we have more objects in it and better uh, attributes. So certain attributes are included as part of global HR or global payroll so that you can do data loading of all such attributes. One another important activity here is that the business object view is also enhanced, meaning it would not clearly tell you if this particular attribute or if that particular object or task is actually required when you do a data loading or is it decommissioned or is it conditionally required. So this actually would help you to identify, you get clarity on what should be loaded. And one very important feature, and, and, and I see this would be a very uh, glad news for people who are on the reporting side, is that you can now take a summary information of the HCM data loader objects that's done and the spreadsheet loaders. So you can create your own OTBI reports and then get this summary information. On the spreadsheet data loader, which is called as HSDL, there are now a few objects. So under compensation, you can load mass upload external data and stock. And under global HR, it is for allocated checklist. So as I said, we would look into detail in that specific sessions. Apart from that, there are certain upgrade uh, features in terms of uh, renaming extract definition. So for example, you already have a defined extract. Again, this is a bit technical, so probably the IT team members would uh, be able to see the benefit of this particular feature. So the rename extract definition will actually help you to change the name when you import a particular definition or when you migrate it to another instance and you want to keep versioning. So you want to rename that particular extract. The other important feature that's coming up is defaulting the effective date. So the effective date is basically a parameter which is very important for all the data loading and extracts that you do. So now this effective date can be defaulted at the definition page rather than you know, doing it at the task level. So earlier it was done at the task level in the refined extracts page, but now you can do it at the definitions page. So the last but not the least, so this is more important even for a business user, is that you can easily now identify if an extract is incremental in nature or is it full run. So meaning you have options if you when you do an extract, whether you want to push complete data. To, as an extract report or do you want to just do the changes only? So now you can look at the extract and tell whether it is a change only or incremental while before you have to actually get into the definition of the extract and see. So it's more easier now to identify these details. A very wonderful feature, I would say, wanted feature for organizations that were using multiple estimates or that are using multiple estimates rather, is you now have security at assignment level. So what does it really mean for you is that you can now give access to people based on the assignment. So for example, you have two managers for a person. So assignment one has manager and manager A and assignment two has manager B. So you can restrict the access of manager A 
only for assignment one. So that is the level of security that you can do. So for example, if you see here, this is before 21 assignment level security, this particular employee who's got two assignments, the manager is able to see both of them. But once you turn it on, this particular manager is able to see only one assignment of that course. So I know it's going to be a very quick description, but uh, trust me, we would be talking about this in every module because this is impacting all modules, absences, talent, uh, goals, learn. So all modules have this data security. So this is a wonderful feature, but it's not a quick one because the effort behind testing that, the effort behind configuring it is, is higher. So organizations which need a real security at assignment level should look for this, but probably take it in phases so that it doesn't impact your regular business. This is another enhancement on transaction console. So you have two new features on the transaction control, which is the resubmit feature and then the archive feature. So basically, now when you resubmit a particular transaction, uh, 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 transaction, you get notified. So you know that a transaction has been resubmitted. And then a resubmission happens. It happens based on, so it checks if there are already related transactions happening. So if there is already another transaction submitted to the same kind of task, then it, it checks before resubmitting it. And the archive actually helps you. So if you have lost completed transactions, it looks cumbersome to look at, at the page so you can archive them. You have option of three months, six months or nine months, or you don't have to archive also. But then archiving actually helps to improve the performance of this page. Uh, this is more technical, so I would want to uh, restrict talking on this. This is on the configure business objects where you use manual grouping. So if, if we have some technical people on call, if you want to have know more about it, you can connect to us uh, separately. On the common architecture, there are enhancements on questions. Again, questionnaires and questions are used across various modules, so it's kept as a common architecture. So now you can have contexts that you can relate to questions. You can have maximum scores that can be updated automatically. And then you can also maintain versions of questions and questionnaires when you want to update the questions, which is already present in a questionnaire. So we would be talking more about this during our talent uh, webinar. One important update for, again, on a technical side is define SFTP configuration for HCM extracts. So what does this mean is before the 20D, you whenever you have to transfer data securely using extracts, you always have to connect it through a BIP transfer mechanism. But going forward from 20D, you don't have to have the BIP architecture or the BIP layer in between. So you can directly transfer from SFTP using data exchange. So this SFTP would support compression and encryption of data. So this basically means that this is going to improve your runtime efficiency. That's a very quick, I know probably it might look it's too much in a very short time, but then we would get into those details. So we want to look into the features which are quick wins, but you don't require any configurations, so it's it's more easier. The first one, so these are the features now we're going to discuss are in the global HR. And the first one in that is the extensible flex fields. So you know that Oracle allows us to configure fields to capture more information. But now, according to you know, certain legislations or certain countries have data protection rules. So in case if the person is no more in your organization, you are not allowed to maintain certain data about that person. So it's now more easier that you can dispose of all those data uh, even for extensible flex fields. So this disposal was there for objects, various objects of person and assignment and, and, and other modules, but now they've also introduced extensible flex fields in this. Just a point to note that this object would remove in, uh, only for terminated workers. And so 
because you want to retain the information for the active employees. Yeah, this one is a very good feature in terms of tracking what's happening in the HR system. So for example, you create a new position or you change something on the position, you change an attribute on the position. You now have the option to add attachments that can support your activity. So why are you creating a position or why are you making this change? So you can add or attach documents which can give you more details of that particular change. So when you do that, you can click and click on attachment, just add the attachment, and then this is there. So you understand why this particular position was created or updated. So this could be used and you know to reduce your paperwork, maintaining documents of why you're doing something, you can attach them all on the system and keep it electronic. This one is an enhancement on V3. Um, so uh, you, you must be aware that the seniority date has got multiple versions, V1, V2, and V3. So V3 is the recently introduced version. Now, along with this migration, so now when, when you're migrating from V1 to V3, you have certain activities that you can do. So you can move from V2 seniority to non-cumulative V3, V1 and V2 seniority to non-cumulative V3. So the cumulative non-cumulative basically tells you if you want to consider the previous work relationship when you look at the seniority date. So suppose you have somebody moving from one uh, entity of your organization to another entity. So when, what is the rule that you want to do, or what, how you want to calculate the seniority date. So that's what basically tells about cumulative and non-cumulative. So this was something already existing. So cumulative, non-cumulative is not new, but the way we migrate from V1 to V3 is more controlled now using these parameters. This is one another feature on employment flows where the notifications that you currently send can or will show only data that the particular approval is supposed to see for that person that is governed by data role. So what does this mean is that you have a person who's allowed to see only for example, just the payroll name and not more details about the contract type or worker type, then if you have restricted that access on the main employment page using data roles, you can now see that the approval notifications also has the same restriction. So earlier, if the notification was sent, it would include all details of the person of that particular employment, but now it is restricted based on the data roles that is given to that particular approval. So basically, this would just give you a quick glance of what I mean here. So you have Buffer A1 with just a view privilege, so they can just view, but they cannot edit that particular transaction. Now, Worker A2 has view and edit, they can do both. Now, Worker S1 has only edit. They can't view the current or proposed work relationship changes, but they can be able to edit but when they, sorry, when they try to edit, they would also see an error message because they didn't have a view access, so obviously you cannot edit. So worker S1 basically can't do anything there. And worker S2 can do both. He can view and he can edit. So now how, how are these governed? So when we say privileges, it's being governed by the roles that are given to the particular user. Now we're gonna see certain features on checklists. So allocated checklist deletion, so now that Again, this is also an enhancement in terms of disposal of data, again, for the restriction that the legislation might meet. So you have a person who's already terminated. You don't want to have that information. You can now delete all the checklists. So this deletion often was already there, but then, then what is enhanced now is that you can also delete all associated tasks of that checklist. You can also delete all data related to particular to that tasks like you know, your questionnaires or attachments of any configurable forms that you have created, all of that could be deleted. Just a point to note that if any document or attachment is stored in DOR, then you cannot delete. This feature is more on the look and feel, okay? So the document of records now by default excludes payroll category. So you have, you know, on document of records, various kinds of category, 
which would say so you see a category here you can say whether it's a passport information or suppose you're storing pay slips or any payroll related information you can keep a category called payroll so if you have that categorical uh, level on document types then any one document on payroll would be excluded by when you see default so what does this mean or what's the benefit is that you see a cumbersome sorry you don't see a cumbersome page where there are a lot of document of records and the employee has to search over so you show them the right information by excluding payroll and you also exclude expired documents so how do we see or should we say a document is expired if the to date of the document is less than any is less than the system date that you're trying to look at the document of records then those would be by default excluded. So this is a default view. Obviously, you can just click on close and say if you want to include payroll or want to include expired uh, documents. But then the benefit of this feature is just to store document of records which are really important and keep the rest behind so that the performance of the speed in terms of load of the page is also enhanced by defaulting or exclusion of these items. So the performance of the DO has been improved. Now, another additional enhancement here on the document of records is that you now see certain extra attributes at the document of records page. So you can see a document number, what's the thumb date, to date, issuing authority. So the benefit of this is that if you have similar names of, of, of all kinds of categorical, a category of information of different document types, you can just look at these additional information which can tell you what is the right document that you have to look on. So just an ease of use for the user who uses this page. This is again a UI enhancement on DOR. So instead of clicking on the document type name, you now have a IR glass. So you click on this to see drill down on the same page rather than navigating to another page to see the details of that particular document. So uh, irrespective of whatever is the document name attributes, so sometimes uh, document name attributes will be hidden and then it becomes difficult for you to drill down and so you have to have that name on that page. So all of that puzzle is removed. You can just click on the eyeglass icon and then look into the drill down details of the document. Okay, this is a UI user friendly change, I would say, just to enhance. So there are certain changes in terms of the questioners, questions and questioners, titles of them. So they've been just rephrased. So this is just, a, you know, it's it's too much of a rephrase, uh, too much of a rephrase here. So for example, contract is now renamed as contract info, assignment info is renamed as assignment. So these are just a quick uh, glance that you can have. So this could be very important for the end user who's using the screen, who have a non-IT background. So they might get a bit confused with the refaces. So this should go as a, probably as a communication to your users that these are the refaces of the titles that's there. The next one is on grade lookup. So basically the grade lookup on the retained grade page. So if you are having a retained grade uh, feature, then this lookup called grade earlier used to show the list only with grades that are attached to a grade ladder. But now you here you can see all the grades. So suppose you have certain grades which are not part of your grade ladder, but you want to attach them for a retained grade, you can do that now. Okay, now on the responsive pages, we have an option to edit an allocated checklist task. So you can actually go ahead and edit certain task attributes. So you have an option, say click, go to the task, and then click on edit task, and then you can edit these attributes. So you can edit comments, descriptions, start date, end date, a lot of attributes that you see here. So what's the benefit of this is you maintain or you end or you maintain correct data. So there is data accuracy 
And then you also have the ability to change certain attributes even after a task is allocated. So if there's something wrong that's you realize that it's wrong only after its allocation, you can still go ahead and change them. And this is the same thing, but again at a checklist level. So the previous slide that we saw was more at the task level of checklist, but this feature is on the checklist also. Mass reassign checklist. So this is a wonderful feature for an organization where you have a lot of people and you do a lot of reassignment of tasks. So then now you can just do it all in one day. You can say, you know, select people and say reassign tasks for these people. So it's more of an ease of activity that you do. So it's more easy for the HR now. Additional person info. So this is a very uh, advantageous feature for the employee. So you can allocate the application task to additional person info to a particular checklist. So what happens is on the checklist, when an employee clicks, he, he can directly go into the additional person info. So the navigation is more easier and provides a direct access to that particular page via checklists. Contact validation. So if I have some customers from Switzerland, this is just an update for them that worker data validation report now gives or gives information if what what is the main contract that is there against the work relationship. So basically contracts are important uh, because multiple contracts are supported in Switzerland. So this report actually helps them to see if there is at least one contract. So if you don't have a contract, the report tells you that. So this is an early identification. For customer from Netherlands, this is a, a full name format that is now available there. You can allow the person, the employee to choose the partner for a name format style. So when you want to capture partner information, you can choose uh, what should be the style of the full name. So it's more of a flexibility given to an employee. For customers who are using wellness and volunteering, you now have an ability to mark a particular team as private. So what do we mean by private team is that it's into a restricted group. So this could be done for wellness team or volunteering team so that the members are hidden and you, you have a, uh, you know, hidden conversation, a private conversation, just like a private chat that you have on, on any of the chatting uh, app now. This is for customers who use health and safety. So thought of including that uh, during this pandemic situation, I think we have a lot of customers who have opted for health and safety module. Uh, more so because the uh, licensing part of it is also uh, possibly free. So just in this, what you can do is the stakeholders, you can assign a stakeholder to a particular incident. This was available earlier, but then what you can do right now is apart from incident, you can also give them incident events, incident investigation. So if there's somebody in, in the organization who was holding this incident register and wants to know every information about the incident, you can then create that person so your health and safety manager or, or his team could become stakeholders for incidents. The next is on uh, filters for incident lists, again for health and safety. So I'm just going quickly because we're running short of time. So that brings us to an end of often of frequency which are default with no configuration. We're quickly moving on to frequency with our with minor configurations. So this one is on lookup codes for communication method. So uh, FACS, which is FX and BML are now removed from communication method, more so because uh, it, they're not enabled to capture more information on that particular communication method. So it was just there as a list of values. So removing them actually simplifies the user experience and eliminates any confusion. Now you have an improvised edit work relationship page. So what is that improvisation is that you see a clear page. So there is work relationship info, which has become optional. You can hide the worker attribute by default. So by default, the worker attribute is not there, but if you want to show, you can enable it. And then the attributes are actually ordered in terms of what is an enterprise information and what is the primary information of that particular set. 
So we can now control what should be visible in the work relationship page on the responsive UI. The list of values for reporting establishment and grade step. This is a very minor uh, enhancement, but then could be useful. So you get relevant suggestions as you type on on the grade step or on the reporting establishment. For organizations who do who does a lot of mass legal employer change or transfers, you now have the ability to add legal employer and country parameters. So on the design studio, you can add these parameters, create rules so that you can ensure that the mass legal employer change transaction has very minimal errors. So this does require a little of configuration, but then it improves all your manual work. Ah, this is a wonderful feature for organizations where you have a lot of checklists, you have a lot of tasks against checklists. Now you can send a single summary notification for checklists, tasks per performer per day per checklist. So meaning, you reduce the number of email notifications that goes, so you help them to have a summarized view of all the notifications that they have had for the day. Okay, volunteering history is just to uh, people who are, have implemented this module and our volunteers can now see or keep track of whatever volunteering they have, that they have done in the past. So this is, you can view or print the summary of that as, as an information. So quickly move on, moving on to options. We just have a few here. Okay, for organizations, especially now that we all to work from home options, this is a very good feature because you can, you can now allow employees to enter phone numbers without defaulting that to the organization's location. So if you want them to enable to enter a different country's code and phone number, you can do that now, but you have to enable a op profile option. Under position management, there are new attributes that you can see as part of the position hierarchy. So when you create position hierarchies, you can actually go ahead and add budget details or whatever the position template, delegate position details. So these are extra information that you can capture against a position hierarchy. Uh, the assignment weekly working hours. So the section where we add the weekly hours is actually added to the employment flow now in the responsive UI page. So this is the one that's added, which was not there before. So what does that mean to you is that you can easily navigate on a single page. So this would be available on add a pending worker, a transfer, a change working hours uh, transactions. So it's more easier and quicker to enter those details. Okay. Uh, another update again on add assignment flow is that you can add the payroll details at step one itself. So when you create or add an assignment, you now have an option to enter the payroll details. On the health and safety module, if there is, uh, there are now better clar uh, classifications in terms of source of injury and mechanism of injury. So you actually capture more information on how a particular incident happened or how an injury happened especially if you are in an organization where there are uh, work-related uh, accidents that could happen. So this could help you to analyze the injury details and have a better workplace. This is just uh, an enhancement in terms of ability to change or hide a particular event type of an incident, a very minor one, but could be useful for organizations where you have health and safety. So that quickly brings us to an end of the features that I wanted to talk about. chart frequency. Please do visit the rest features. On the OTBI part, we have few uh, enhancements. There are certain new subject areas on integrations, HCM integrations, organizations who have a lot of integrations with third party applications. Please do visit this. There are also more information on source assignment of a global transfer, so which means you can now report if you have a lot of global transfers that happens in your organization, you can now report on the source assignment details. And this one is on injury or that which is a health and safety module. Very important item which we have to understand is the replaced or removed features on 20D. So all of you must be already aware that PBL is no more available for objects, for payroll objects. You have to use HCM data loader. So this is a must now in 20D. Checklists are available only on the responsive pages, so no more classic UI. 
Uh, I, I, I believe that everybody would be on responsive UI already. Access to change legal employer flow. So this is very important for organizations where you have law transfers. You don't, you cannot use change legal employer, but you have to use global and legal transfer on the responsive page. So on the known issues, it's more repetitive of what we saw in 20C. So uh, all the known issues that you see here is, is more of what you saw on 20C already. So you, you may want to record this. The issues are still there. There are workarounds mentioned. Apologies, I'm not taking you over them for two reasons. One, it's short of time, and two, that it's more repetitive of 20C. So that's what I have today. Uh, to talk about Oracle Hexium Global Features. I would now like to hand it over to Chris. Thanks so much for that. Um, I, I can clearly see that there's lots of other areas to, to potentially talk about um, in the HCM update. So um, please do visit the, um, the website afterwards for, for a copy of the, um, of the slides. Um, but I, I am sure that there are things in this release that each of our guests today, Priya, will, will um, look to deploy and, and benefit from. Um, so earlier, we, we spoke about the four-step cycle to handling a release, and, and we've just spent some time analyzing that, those features in, in the HR modules. And once you've finalized your analysis after today, you'll, you'll no doubt start planning the rollouts with your teams and, and will commence testing. If you are already an EVASYS customer um, and want us to be involved in any of those um, phases, please do reach out to, to your project manager. And for non evasys customers wanting to know a bit more about how we can help with these phases, um, please do get in touch with us and we can talk you through our services. One of the most exciting areas is, for me anyway, is our use of um, a technology that can save you up to 70% of testing time. We all know the overhead that UAT creates across a business, but this solution we use runs all the defined processes and, and captures screenshots as it progresses through before marking them as a process themselves, success or failure. And that then means that we can focus on the failed processes by you know, potentially reviewing and resolving any config issues, or if necessary, actually alerting Oracle to any software related issues that need to be fixed. And the great thing about this is it's not just about the time saved, it's also about the speed in which the tests are done. So in, effectively, it gives us more elapsed time um, to, to just make sure that, that, that you're ready. Another thing to consider is, is what, what, we, um, what we can do to, um, to work with you on the impact analysis that's specific to your, to your organization. Whilst we have taken you through the features and, and the potential impact, these impacts will vary from organization to organization, so we can actually work with you to further understand how specifically it impacts your organization. So our services go beyond supporting the, the quarterly updates, and I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about the EVASYS Next Generation Managed Service and what it can do to help you. So we're, we're passionate about driving business value from your Oracle Cloud. And that's why our managed services doesn't focus on just keeping the lights on for our customers. It focuses on what can be done to continually improve the outcomes of using Oracle Cloud apps. So we very much see our managed services as a partnership to work with you to enhance your Oracle Cloud experience and not just keep those lights on, as, as I've already said. But we all ultimately want you to, to get business value out of this relationship. So our managed services there's a number of options to give you flexibility on the services that you actually specifically want to include. So overarching and, and complementing our managed services is our value-based analytics that are used to measure and monitor business-defined KPIs that focuses the attention on the continuous improvement. There are many areas where the value-based analytics can be used. So please do contact us to, to find out more about those if you're, if you're not already using them. Our next generation managed service is also about empowerment and helping you to drive a lot more self-sufficiency. So some of this is also about leveraging the technology value adds that we, that we use as part of the wider service. And, and this includes the use of things like 
responsive digital assistance, for example, to help with self-sufficiency, as well as robotic process automation, or, or RPA as, as we know it in the industry now, to remove some of those repetitive manual tasks. So this opens up the ability for, for more focused work on innovation and continuous improvement. And, and for me, collaboration plays an, a very important part in innovating. So we continue to work together with our customers to drive those innovations. And lastly, it encourages KPI-driven support. So traditional managed services would, would monitor ticket numbers and length of time taken to close those tickets based on severities. And we just don't do this. Our KPI-driven approach focuses on giving our customers a good outcome, which ultimately means reducing the number of tickets that are raised. So we work on not only resolving the ticket, but also ensuring that the root cause is investigated and resolved to stop further instances from happening. And it then allows us more time to work on the other areas that I mentioned earlier. And our approach is also about ensuring that we maintain the service level commitment that we've set out at the start with the customer and continuing to provide that greater value through agreeing on and delivering those outcomes. And what, it's very important to us to, to, um, to get continuous feedback from our customers. So um, as we progress through tickets with our, with our customers and, and, and deal with, with issues that they may have, we also always look to, to ask those customers how we've done. And we're really, really proud of the fact that you know, across the globe, we're, we're maintaining a consistent level of good support for, for our customers. And, and you know, we, we don't rest on our, our laurels. We're continually looking at ways of, of continually improving the service that we offer to our customers. So hopefully that gives you a, a slight taster of, of what our managed service is about. Um, just a, as, a, as a closing note for me, um, before we move on to, to questions. So what happens next? So um, we've got a, an area on our website, evasysglobal.com, that, that talks about our webinar. So what we're going to be doing um, anyway is, is sending each and every one of you the, the presentation and actually um, the session recording uh, or the link to the session recording that, um, that we're doing right now, as well as any test scripts that we can actually offer you as part of your UAT. We're also going to, going to send you a feedback form. Now, we find these, the, these sessions are, are great uh, and it's a great way of engaging with our customers and, and non evasive customers, but it's really important for us to hear from you, what, how you find these, um, these sessions. Is there any feedback, good or bad, that can help us in, um, to continually improve? Also, if, if you're an EVASYS customer, please do reach out to your project manager, or if you're a non-EVASYS customer, please contact us at, um, at the email address that, that we're displaying now. Um, just to, if you want to talk about the additional services around the quarterly updates that I've, that I've just taken you through, or actually, if you want to know more about the next generation cloud managed service that, um, that I've taken you through as well. And also, don't forget the, um, the next session. So this is now the second session that, that we've run. Earlier today, we did one on finance. Um, we have uh, the, the remaining sessions this week, one on talent management, one on work, workforce management, one on supply chain management. And then we have two separate sessions, one for, for payroll in the UK and one for payroll in the US. So and please do share the, um, uh, this information with, with your colleagues in those specific areas of the business if, if you feel that there's value in, in them actually attending those. So finally, um, Priya, we're just going to have a look to see if there's any unanswered questions before we draw to a close, because I'm very conscious that we're right on time. Or maybe we can unmute. Uh, people who have raised hands in case if they want to speak up and ask a question. Are there any specific questions that have left unanswered? Any any final questions from anyone? If you, if you see that anyone's raised their hands, please do um, unmute them if, if you if you can. Yeah, I see Nina Cleary, so, but I guess uh, the audio of her is cut, so I'm, I'm not sure if I can. Yeah, her, unfortunately, her audio is not connected. Yeah. Nina, if, if you can hear us, please please um, write a question in the, in the chat option. So we, we do have a question around um, slides from the website um, from one of our, our guests. 
we will um, send out an email with all of that information to you. Um, if, if you wanted to go onto ebusglobal.com, um, you can actually access it from there, but, but we'll actually send you the, the direct link um, after, this, after this webinar. Okay, as there are no further questions, um, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining us today. I, I hope you found the, the session useful. Um, and we'll hopefully see you on, on a few of the other sessions. Thank you very much.